So I'm going to spend some time defining personality, defining what a personality disorder is, uh, what a healthy personality would look like. So we're going to cover the basics there. That won't take very much time. Then I'm going to talk about uh, what personality disorders have in common. Now today, we're going to be talking about 10 different subtypes of personality disorder that are listed and described in the new DSM, the DSM-5. But before we do that, I thought it would be helpful to talk about what all of these personality disordered individuals have in common. There are certain core characteristics that they share. And I want to spend some time with you on that because it is my belief that you can tease out those characteristics in the first or second interview or meeting with the patient. There's value in being able to determine that you're working with a personality disordered patient quickly. Because as we're go going to see later, it, the, the faster you know um, that you're working with someone who's personality disordered, um, the easier it's going to be for you to tailor your therapeutic intervention to that person's personality. Let me give you an example. If you quickly determine that you're working with someone who suffers from borderline personality disorder, one of the things that you're going to want to be very careful about from the very beginning of treatment is setting and enforcing clear, consistent limits with them on the nature of your relationship. Because if you don't do that, uh, people with this disorder will uh, engulf you. They, they will consume you. They're like emotional vampires. So they'll be calling and leaving lengthy voicemail messages for you at all hours of the day and night. They'll be showing up unannounced without an appointment and expect you to drop what you're doing and seeing them. They'll want to friend you on Facebook. They have no concept of boundaries. And so if you pick up on that in the first two or uh, one or two visits, then you know, hey, you know what, I'm going to have to be uh, especially careful here in setting very clear boundaries with this individual uh, so that they don't consume me and so that I can be helpful in working with them. That's just one example of how it can be helpful to know early on in the therapeutic relationship um, that you're working with someone who's personality disordered. I would also add that if you're reasonably certain that you're working with someone who has borderline personality disorder, you should not have any physical contact with that patient other than a handshake. Uh, because borderline patients characteristically misread any type of physical affection as sexual interest. The biggest mistake you can make with a borderline patient is to hug them. I know some of you are just by nature very warm, gregarious uh, kinds of people. That may be part of your style in working with patients. You don't ever, ever hug a borderline patient. Because if you do, um, you have set the stage for a lawsuit or at least a complaint to your supervisor or a complaint to your licensing board. The vast majority of them have been uh, either physically or sexually abused as children. They've never received treatment for that. They oftentimes have severe PTSD related to that. And they misinterpret physical touch as some sort of sexual touch. And it can cause a lot of problems uh, for the clinician who's not savvy about that. I've had many patients who have tried to hug me typically borderline patients, and I say no. And they're offended by that initially. And then what I say to them is, hey, listen, um, a significant part of why you're here today with me is because your physical and your emotional boundaries were violated when you were a kid. Nothing like that is going to happen in this office. So I'm going to err in the direction of being excruciatingly careful with you and, uh, so that there's no misunderstanding that this is a professional relationship. And when I explain that to the borderline patient, they, they totally get it. They understand that, they're not offended, and they actually feel safer with me because I'm mindful of the fact that they do have issues and difficulty with boundaries. But believe me, this is just yet another example of why you have to be careful with these people. So we'll go over those common characteristics. Then we're going to talk about what I think most of you came for today, and that is um, the 10 flavors of personality disorder, uh, so that by the time that you leave here today, you can recognize these disorders in your family, friends, and coworkers, never yourself. I had a woman who was referred to me, and I knew up front that she was personality disordered. She had previously been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. 
And I agreed to take her case on, even though I was pretty overwhelmed, because she had been working with a female colleague of mine who had developed breast cancer and who was going to have to take a significant amount of time off to undergo the treatment for that. So this was one of her patients, and I was very happy to take this patient on. She'd only had one or two sessions with the patient um, and felt that I would be a good match for this patient. And I said, sure, I'm happy to help you out. So I met with this patient. Um, her first name was Judy, not her real name. We'll say her first name was Judy. This was a 47-year-old Caucasian female, professional woman, highly educated, extremely articulate, well-groomed, well-attired, uh, certainly uh, not what you would call a low-functioning individual by any means. Uh, she had come to me uh, via my colleague, but the reason she had been in treatment was because she was having outbursts of rage at her place of employment, which was scaring the hell out of her coworkers and uh, undermining her credibility, as you could imagine. She also was splitting the staff at the agency where she worked. She was pitting people against each other. She was doing the divide and conquer kind of thing, which uh, personality disorder patients will do sometimes. She also had difficulty with boundaries. Uh, she would cross boundaries um, with uh, some of the uh, people being served by the agency um, and certainly with some of her colleagues. So long story short, she was told in no uncertain terms, you go into therapy and you address these issues or we're going to terminate you. We can see that you're a very bright person, that you bring a lot to the table. We've already invested a lot of money in training you, but we're not going to allow you to stay here if you continue to engage in these inappropriate behaviors. So she was pretty angry because she had been sent to treatment rather than coming into treatment of her own volition. Understandable. So she comes in for the intake interview. She's meticulously groomed and attired, very professional looking. I take her upstairs, we sit down, we exchange pleasantries for maybe two minutes. And then she launches into this. And she says to me, there's something about me that you need to understand, Dr. Shannon, if this therapy is going to work. I said, Judy, I'm all ears. What do I need to understand? Dr. Shannon, I am a deeply sensitive person. I feel my feelings more intensely than the average person, most especially my rage. And that's just how she said it. And to be perfectly frank, folks, at that moment, I felt the hair go up on the back of my neck. This is what happens when men are with aggressive women. Men never like to admit that. Guys, it's just like walking into the Atlantic Ocean in the dead of winter, okay? And she says, because I'm such a sensitive person, there are going to be times when I'm in a session with you where I may want to savor a feeling that I'm having. And so I may want to do something dramatic to really get in touch with that feeling. Would you have a problem with that, Dr. Shannon? And I said, well, Judy, I said, I agree with you that you being able to come here and for this to be a safe place to deal with any feeling that you have, that that's going to be an essential part of your treatment. I, you and I are on exactly the same page. So I'm really glad you brought this up. But here's my concern. I share this building with seven other therapists who will be working with patients at the same time that I'm seeing you. This is an old farmhouse that's been converted into an office building. The rooms are not completely soundproof, which is why we have white noise machines in the hallway to you know, protect people's privacy. I don't have a problem with you getting in touch with a feeling, provided that your process of doing that doesn't interfere with or create an obstacle for the other therapists and the other patients. Give me an idea of what you might want to do. She seemed really put off and put out by my request that she do that. So she looks at me and she says, well, for example, you're undoubtedly going to be querying me about my background and my relationship with my mother and my father, which was dreadful, to be perfectly frank. So as I'm getting in touch with my rage towards my mother or my father, I may want to get down on your floor at your feet 
flail my arms and my legs and scream at the top of my voice. That's how I would get in touch with my angry inner wounded child. Would you have a problem with that, Dr. Shannon? I mean, this woman was just seething, seething hostility and rage. So I took a quick sip of my chamomile tea, <laughs> which tragically was not laced with gin. And um, being a Roman Catholic, I quickly said a prayer. Roman Catholics have a patron saint for every emergency. Now, if Judy had been a prostitute, I would have said a quick prayer to St. Trixie. If she had been a male prostitute, I would have said a quick prayer to St. Chad. But Judy was not that type of person. And because this was a mental health situation, I said a quick prayer to a very real saint, St. Dymphna. St. Dymphna is the patron saint of mental and nervous disorders. She's an Irish saint, and she's much revered in the Catholic Church. So I said, Dymphna, girlfriend, I need you in a nanosecond. I then turned to Judy, and I said, Judy, I appreciate you being so direct and so upfront with me so early on in the treatment. If you choose to work with me, you'll see that I'm a very direct, upfront kind of guy. So potentially, I think we can work really well together. Let me respond to your question as directly as I can. No, I would never allow that kind of outlandish, outrageous behavior to happen in my office. Judy, I wouldn't put up with that kind of behavior in an out of control four year old. I'm certainly not gonna put up with that type of behavior in a 47 year old PhD clinical psychologist, which is what Judy was. She was a PhD clinical psychologist. Well, why? Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you allow that? I said, you've asked me a fair question. I'll give you a fair answer. And I'm going to be perhaps more blunt with you than I would be the, with the typical patient because if you choose to work with me, you're not only going to be a client, you're clearly a peer. So I'm going to speak our language. Judy, you're borderline. You have borderline personality disorder. You're on the border of psychosis 24-7. We both know what that means. It means that you have critical pieces missing from your personality, not the least of which is modulation of affect, most especially your anger. You don't need to do something dramatic to get in touch with any emotion, least of all your anger. You have diarrhea of anger. It's the major reason you're in trouble at work. It's the major reason that you've not been able to keep a job for any length of time. It's the major reason that you lost custody of your two teenage children. It's the major reason that you're working on divorce number five. You have major problems with dealing with your emotions. If I were to sit here and allow you to act out like a, like a spoiled child, I would be enabling the very pathology that I should be treating. That makes me part of your problem instead of part of your solution. You deserve better than that. I refuse to be part of your problem. I will only be part of your solution. So if you're going to work in treatment with me, we're going to work on helping you contain that anger. We're going to teach you how to express it in an adult-like fashion, not acting out like a spoiled or out of control child. I won't be a party to that. Well, I need to think about this. You do that. You do that. And if you want to come back and learn how to live like an adult and act like an adult, I'm your guy. But if you want me to enable you, I'll never see you again. Well, she came back. And we worked over the course for about two years, and she made remarkable progress.